20 years and seven agreements later, peace remains a distant promise, a roadmap to nowhere. As the Obama administration tries to revive the peace process, our objective will be to achieve a final status agreement over the course of the next nine months. We ask if a fair resolution is even possible, considering its special relationship with Israel. Israelis love to be loved. Is America the honest broker it claims? Have successive U.S. administrations colluded to deny the establishment of a Palestinian state? And will Washington recognize its failure and give it up? I don't think that Washington will ever say that. We ask, what drives America's diplomacy? so long on process, so short on peace, and what needs to change to achieve a comprehensive peace. I am Marwan Bishara, and this is Empire. In secret. In a faraway place. Forty-six years of war, dispossession, and occupation. One side claimed the other had no right to be there or have a right to a state. The other said they were neither a nation nor a people. They were nothing. You can't make a deal with someone who's not there. Why bother to make a deal with someone who must leave? You can't even talk to each other. Then there was Oslo. Secret talks had been put together in Norway. I talked to both Israeli negotiators and Palestinian negotiators, and eventually uh, I came to the understanding that the way it was organized in, in Washington couldn't possibly succeed. The PLO was not allowed to participate. The Israelis wouldn't talk to them directly, and the Americans were forbidden by one of their own peculiar roles from ever talking to one of the two most important parties to the disputes. We seek peace, real peace. We, in, in a way, we decided to do exactly the opposite of what they did in Washington. And one of the first things I discovered when I spoke uh, in, uh, in, in Gaza and Jerusalem and Tel Aviv uh, with the uh, Palestinian and, and the Israeli negotiators was that they were telling me things which was exactly the opposite of what they were saying on television. In Oslo, the PLO and the Israelis came up with a declaration of principles. The big revolution was the mutual recognition between the national uh, uh, movement of Palestine and, uh, and Israel. The PLO recognized Israel, the state, as sovereign and independent and ruling over 78% of historic Palestine, while Israel recognized a political organization, the PLO, as a representative of the Palestinian people. And they agreed to the establishment of self-rule in the occupied territories. There were only two things left to do, inform the Americans and hold a photo op. The world would react as if a transcendent diplomatic miracle had occurred. But then... It began to fall apart. Oslo wasn't really a peace deal. It was the framework agreement in which peace was supposed to be negotiated between a bankrupt Palestinian leadership and a confident Israel. But there was a solution. Oslo, too. I think that uh, it was mainly uh, Hamas and the extreme organizations on the Palestinian side and uh, the uh, rightist uh, organizations on the Israeli side, which actually 
uh, thwarted the, this uh, effort. Uh, the main point, if you ask me, was the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Oslo II turned out to be even less a solution than Oslo. Instead of liberating and uniting the newly autonomous territories, the new agreement divided the areas and subjugated them to new layers of control. But there was a solution. Resume the peace process. With handshakes and photo ops and a Camp David summit where everything could be agreed. Except it wasn't. This time, instead of an agreement that failed, there was a failure to agree. But in 2002, a new peace initiative came from a surprising direction, at least surprising to the West. The Arab League proposed a simple but sweeping deal. Land for peace, return to the 1967 borders, in return for peace with all the Arab nations and a guarantee of security. Israel rejected it. George W. Bush marginalized it. Yeah, I'm just following your example. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> After 2001, the worldwide war on terror was launched. It seemed a good time to restart the peace process. Enter the quartet. The UN, the US, Russia, and the EU all got together to produce the roadmap to peace. The last 20 years have seen the Israeli settler population go from 200,000 to 600,000. Yes, it's time to bring back the peace process. Obama met with Abbas. He met with Netanyahu. He ordered Netanyahu to stop building settlements in the West Bank. America does not accept the legitimacy of continued Israeli settlements. Yes, it's time to bring back the peace process. The parties should be focused on making progress towards the direct negotiations. These negotiations are like the walking dead. I mean, they are a zombie. So. Is it a process? Yes. Does it bring peace? Absolutely not. Then what shall we call it? The occupation process, the distraction process, the flim flam, the long con, the hustle, the sting, the swindle. Why don't we just call it the process? To help us unpack the process, I'll speak to three diplomats who were actually part of the process. Daniel Kurtzer, former US ambassador to Israel, and Alvaro de Soto, a former UN envoy to the process. And later, I'll have a discussion with Noura Arikat, Peter Barnard, and Nathan Thrall. But first, I dropped by the James Baker Institute for Public Policy at Rice University in Texas to speak to its director, a Georgian former ambassador to Israel and the author of Danger and Opportunity, an American Ambassador's Journey Through the Middle East. I began by asking for his assessment of America's role in the process over the last 20 years. Well, America's role has been both as a catalyst and then as a party that has stood by uh, over the last 20 years. But we have missed too many opportunities, and I believe the United States has not been actively engaged in the process in a meaningful way at various points over the 20 years to make a real difference. But to come to a final agreement, the issues are so profound that, and the differences between the parties still so wide, that without a strong American hand, I do not see the parties coming together to do it. So that's why I think the criticality of who? The president, the president of the United States, because without the president of the United States fully committed to Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, no matter how good his secretary of state is, uh, it's not going to happen. It's been 20 years. So the record shows that with or without the president, the situation has only gotten worse for the Palestinians. And the Israelis have only settled more and more of the land. Hence, we can speak of failure. We can certainly speak in failure to come to a final settlement. There's no question about it. Don't you think that there was this original sin whereby the dissymmetry and recognition was that the representative of the Palestinian people will recognize Israel as a state, but Israel will only represent, uh, recognize the organization called the PLO. 
Yes, there's always been. It's an asymmetrical relationship between Israel and the Palestinians even today. But shouldn't have that been the role of the United States to ensure that there's a certain symmetry between the Palestinians? Yes, right? and, and we, we tried hard. We tried hard for that, but we got a great deal of resistance in Israel not to uh, uh, accept the Palestinians on that equal footing. But in this relationship, in this triangle relationship, the close relationship, the special of the special relationships, is that between the U.S. and Israel? Yes, it's a very close relationship, as you know, a very strong relationship. But I think that because of the special relationship between the United States and Israel, and because the United States still remains a preeminent power in the world, that without a strong American hand, uh, there will not be an Israeli-Palestinian agreement. And, but the problem with that is that within Washington's clique or group of influentials on the Middle East policy, it's mostly friends of Israel. Well, I think you have people uh, who get hooked on to this uh, Middle East process. I hate the word peace process. Uh, to me, it's like a, a food processing machine, you know, process for the sake of process. We, we have to to move from conflict management to conflict resolution, from talking about peace to actually engaging in peace negotiations. That is the trick. And the Washington syndrome, if you will, has been to get so imbued with process that the big picture is lost. It's by design by those who advocate process for the sake of process to really not get anything done. Right and to have the shadow of peace talks, but not the reality. And that's what we have now, lots of process and, and no peace. Exactly. Uh, if, there is, if there ever this will on the part of the American administration, will it be able to coerce or convince Israel to withdraw from the West Bank and East Jerusalem? Let me put it this way. Uh, we just have to make a proposition to Israel it cannot refuse. Which means? Which means? The President of the United States, President Obama, invites Netanyahu and Abu Mazen to Washington. He says, gentlemen, it is one of the most important issues in national security interests of the United States that you make peace. Here is my frame of reference. Here is an American terms of reference endorsed by the President of the United States on the key issues, territory, Jerusalem, refugees, all that. Given what you have described as a very special relationship between Israel and the United States, it's very hard for any Israeli prime minister to say no to an American president. But if we continue with a process and not negotiations and basically a stalemate, and the settlers continue, then a two-state solution will truly be elusive. The Israelis are primarily responsible for the settlements, not the United States. But, but shouldn't the United, the United States come out United and States say something State. about it? Well, we have. We have in the past. We do in the current situation. But what we need is leadership. Okay. The terms of reference are there. History is defined by leaders. You know what we need in the Middle East? A man who is now in declining health. We need a Nelson Mandela. You don't think that happened in 1993 then? Back to the, the beginning? It was the beginning, yes. It was the beginning, yes. It's, it looked like it Rabin was, a, was going to be the clerk, and it looks like Arafat was going to be Mandela. That's right. And, and 20 years later? Rabin was assassinated. That was a terrific blow for peace. And then the polit political leadership has been lacking on all sides. I know the American side on all sides. When will the United States say, we failed? Let's say I don't think that Washington will ever say that. 20 years since Oslo, still no peace and no admission that the process has failed. So what about a third party mediator? This is a question I put to Alvaro de Soto, the former United Nations Special Coordinator for the Middle East peace process, and Daniel Kurtzer, former U.S. ambassador to Israel from 2001 to 2005, professor of Middle East policy studies at Princeton University, and the author and editor of several books, his most recent being Pathways 
to peace. It's not up to the United States to allow another mediator to step in. It's up to the parties to make a decision uh, whom they will trust uh, with that role. Uh, the Israelis, for a variety of reasons, don't trust anybody else. They barely trust the United States in this role. And it's the occupying power. And, and the hence occupying it's up to the Israelis so who's going to be sense, they, they exercise a veto with respect to anyone else trying to uh, play that role unilaterally. But I don't see anybody supplanting the United States role, uh, given Israel's uh, adamant stance on this. Especially with the Palestinians agreeing and the Arabs to the U.S. role? So far, that's the case, yeah. It's ultimately the parties to a conflict who choose, or at least have the final say on, who is going to be the mediator or, or the broker. And uh, it's, uh, the, I'm sure the Palestinians have no illusions uh, about the closest, closeness of Israel and uh, the U.S., who happens to be the broker. But do they have a the choice broker. in the matter? Uh, well, I, I think they, they do in a sense, and I think that the reason why uh, at least the, the PLO uh, wants the U.S. is that they believe that only the U.S., if anyone, can deliver uh, Israel. The only framework in which I could imagine a change of a mediator, or at least the question being posed, is if there were as there should be, a Palestinian reunification. I mean, as between Fatah and uh, Hamas. Because this attitude of wanting the U.S. to be in the forefront because only they can deliver Israel, it might not be shared by, uh, by Hamas. Why, why was the U.N. kept uh, on the sidelines? Why were U.N. resolutions kept as a framework or as footnotes in the various agreements? Well, the UN, uh, as a as a player, as a peacemaker, as a as, as a broker, uh, uh, had been largely out of uh, the game in the Middle East uh, for many years, and for a variety of uh, of reasons. Uh, you know, I, I get the sense that uh, the on the Israeli side uh, there was uh, an effort to use uh, Oslo as an opportunity to walk away from the uh, basic foundations of Resolution 242 and the uh, land for peace formula. But, uh, but the PLO and the Palestinians did go to the UN for several decades. And clearly the US but not blocked as a mediator, their effort there. Not as a mediator. Not hmm. as a mediator. I mean, they, they were uh, very uh, clear with me. Uh, Palestinian senior Palestinian officials to the effect that I mean, they even were a little bit exas exasperated. What is the UN doing in the quartet? They said the UN should be the UN. You know, a, a mediator. We have a, a mediator, and uh, the one that we want is the one that we have. So wh why don't you tell us why does the UN accept to be a junior partner to the US in any configuration? In my own view the United Nations, because of the unique characteristics in the international system of the UN Secretary General, I don't believe that he should be uh, part of any negotiating or mediating group of which he is not the leader. It seems to me that once the UN, as, as so-called International Committee, is sidelined, you will remain with the US the main sponsor of Israel. Israel is the bully around the block as far as the Palestinians is concer are concerned. To seek help from Israel's wrath, they go to the United States. That sounds like the godfather to me. Well, if the godfather produces, then one can make the argument that uh, sometimes you, you deal with the devil. In this case, though, it is curious that uh, both the Palestinians and the Arab states keep coming back to the same uh, formula of third-party mediation that has not yet succeeded. Because this is the only way you can avoid the wrath of Israel? is to go to its sponsor. Well, the Palestinians, I think, until now, have not wanted to face Israel alone at the negotiating table. And bringing any other third party to the table is only going to further distance uh, them from Israel. And the key to understanding the U.S. role is not to try to get the U.S. to be more balanced between Israel and an Arab state, but it's to figure out how do you endear yourself to an American potential partner and use that leverage or that uh, inroad in order to try to make progress in the peace process. Isn't that 
exactly the definition of the godfather system? I, I don't want to call it godfather or not. It's, it's a, a practical realpolitik of the way this peace process has worked. But the, the godfather analogy implies that at some point the godfather has got to make whoever is causing difficulties an offer that he can't refuse. And you get more durable solutions if the parties to a conflict can actually uh, come to the conviction that they need to do this for reasons of their own. The only way that Secretary Kerry was able to relaunch the negotiations is by getting a concession out of the Arabs to give up the 1967 borders as the, as the basic line of which it's negotiated. The Palestinians also uh, conceded on the question of freezing the settlements. That's how you, you know, relaunch diplomatic process. The Palestinians and the Arabs concede, and, and Israel gives up a few prisoners. Well, frankly, I don't think that he um, wrested that concession out of Palestinians. I think in practical terms, these negotiations are going to take place on the basis of the 1967 lines with an understanding that there will be uh, swaps of equal quality and equal quantity. So what then is Secretary of State uh, Kerry bringing new to the table? There are some new elements, or at least <clears throat> different elements in Kerry's diplomacy, which is supported by President Obama, that at least should give us some pause. Uh, Kerry has not simply asked Israelis and Palestinians to get to negotiations. He's focused on security for both sides with the appointment of General John Allen. He has looked at Palestinian economic and institution building through the World Economic Forum and the Private Sector Initiative. He has brought the Arab League back into the game through the Arab Peace Initiative. And you think it would be done without shifting the paradigm in terms of the U.S. for a change, perhaps, put some serious pressure, regardless of the local domestic calculation? Well, look, I've made the argument publicly that the United States should now lay out very strong parameters that define quite narrowly the issues still to be negotiated. And then expect the parties, not taking no for an answer, expect the parties to negotiate within those parameters and then give it a shot. On what basis should the U.S. define those parameters, being Israel's closest ally? Well, the... the Does it have the moral standing? No, the, we have our own interests and we would define those parameters on the basis of American national interests and an assessment of what might actually produce progress. Would you say that the U.S. considers the peace process itself regardless whether it works or does not work, as an indispensable national security interest in the region, that it has a peace platform uh, negotiation going on under its own sponsorship. The Obama administration has certainly defined it that way, but I think you saw in the previous administration, the presidency of George Bush, I'm not sure you could have uh, come up with that same definition of national interest. Uh, one of the both frustrations, but great hopes for this administration is that they have defined the peace process as a national interest of the United States and therefore there's a hope and an expectation that they'll do something about it. Well, on that note, thank you gentlemen. And we'll come back after a short news break after which we'll discuss how the U.S.-Israel special relationship affects the peace process. Realistically, the United States is the 900-pound gorilla on the block. You cannot keep them away from the negotiating table. We, the United States, may not be an honest broker, but we can be an effective broker. Both the Palestinians and the Arab states keep coming back to the same uh, formula of third party mediation. Is it up to America to bring peace to the Middle East? I do not see this as a U.S. monopoly, even though the U.S. and many of its allies see it as a monopoly. There's really no one else that can play that role. Realistically, the United States is the 900-pound gorilla on the block. You cannot keep them away from the negotiating table. We, the United States, may not be an honest broker, but we can be an effective broker. I have Israel's back. The United States is the worst possible mediator because it is bound, literally hand and foot, by this 1975 commitment, not to go one iota beyond the Israeli position. I had a conversation with 
some very senior Egyptian policymakers, and they were quite critical of the American role in the peace process. And I said, you know, it may be that a time will come when the United States will simply have to throw up its hands and say we failed and hand this over to somebody else. And the panic in the eyes of these uh, uh, policymakers was, was manifest. Can the United States ever break with Israel? And will the United States actually push the Israelis? The United States, when its national interest has dictated this, has again and again laid down the law to Israel. When Amer the American national interest dictated that uh, the United States imposed something on Israel, it did. In 1974-75 with Kissinger, at Camp David, number one, with Carter, and then Bush and Baker at Madrid, the U.S. has, in fact, used its special relationship with Israel to induce Israel to take some risks that it would not ordinarily make. Why hasn't that happened with Palestine? The United States doesn't have any real dog in the fight, whereas the Israelis really care about this. The conventional wisdom is that it is very much in America's interest to have the Israeli-Palestinian conflict resolved. So why doesn't the United States put pressure on Israel? America and Israel. Is American diplomacy handcuffed by domestic politics? Is there a division of power? America calls the shots in the wider region. Israel calls the shots next door. The so-called peace process was used as an instrument of power by Israel to pursue its policies of annexation and, and settlements to act with impunity, which is what the U.S. wanted. Or is there a more imperial reason, never to be spoken aloud? Is Israel the testing grounds for America's strategy? Back in the Cold War, it was Israel that went up against Soviet-built armor and Russian MiGs. After Arab states joined the United States to drive Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, America had a vision of a Pax Americana in the Middle East, a place of free trade and free markets. And in the Middle East, Israel would be at the center of it. The people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Then America switched to the war on terror, along with generals, intelligence officers, and police forces from all over the world. They look to Israel. From the traditional battlefield to low-intensity conflicts. It was the Israelis who had the know-how in running an occupation with enhanced interrogations, mass incarcerations, targeted assassinations, surveillance with drones, urban warfare, homeland security, and combined police military operations. Which of these scenarios is it? What's really going on here? We'll be talking about that and more with our guests. Peter Barnard, author of Crisis of Zionism, professor of journalism and political science at City University of New York, and senior political writer at The Daily Beast. Nathan Thrall, senior analyst with the Middle East and North Africa program at the International Crisis Group, contributing editor at Tablet Magazine, and former member of the editorial staff of the New York Review of Books. And last but not least, Nora Arikat, a human rights attorney, co-editor of Jadalia, who teaches international human rights law in the Middle East at Georgetown University. Well, gentlemen, Nora, welcome to Empire. Let's kind of take a, an overall uh, look at uh, the last 20 years. Peter, would you say the American role uh, has been a burden or an asset for the peace process? Well, the peace process has not succeeded. Um, so clearly it's not been a success. The, of course, the counterfactual is hard to answer. Right? What would have taken America's place had the United States, let's say, followed Ron Paul's foreign policy and said, we're not interested here? Would regional powers have emerged that would have played a more constructive role? Uh, I think America has made a lot of very serious mistakes. I'm also dubious that any other power or constellation of powers would have been more successful because you do need to have the trust of Israel in order to broker a deal between the two sides. How does it look from Jerusalem? Is there a lockdown on American decision uh, process when it comes to the Middle East? I think the view from, from Jerusalem is that um, the role of the Americans uh, can be and is often greatly overstated. And uh, 
in the past in Arab-Israeli peacemaking, you know, the parties have come together without the Americans, and the Americans have come later. And, and I think it's uh, a mistaken idea that the Americans are necessary uh, to the process. They're necessary to get the two parties together today because the two parties are uninterested in negotiating, and that makes the, the outcome of this round of talks all the more unlikely to succeed. You don't think between an occupied and occupier, a weaker and a, and a stronger party, there's a need for a third party to come in and balance? Absolutely. That, that is, of course, in the Palestinian interest, but is it in the Palestinian interest for that third party to be the, Israel's closest ally? Is it? No, it's probably not in the Palestinian interest, except that another power, let's say the EU or some constitutional regional forces that would be more sympathetic to the Palestinian position, would probably not have the leverage over Israel. I think what you saw with the U.S. and Europe was a somewhat effective playing of good cop and bad cop. You probably need the U.S. plus in order to have the best chance of success. But don't you think that uh, this example that you just cited is evidence that other parties, such as the EU, do indeed have leverage over Israel? They have leverage over Israel, but not in a, not without the United States. It, with, with the United, because the, I think the nationalist reaction in Israel to the EU alone, without America being there as the country that Israelis feel like has a genuine commitment to Israeli security, given the way many Israeli Jews see the historical relationship with Europe, rightly or wrongly, I think creates a political dynamic in Israel that can actually be exploited by the right. I actually think that America is fundamentally part of the problem. Even though it can exert leverage over Israel, it has failed to do so consistently. It can, for example, we condition the US, the, US, the U.S. can condition its funding to Israel, which is now 100 and 103 billion since 1948, and hasn't done so in order to stop settlement expansion, and yet doesn't exist any exert any meaningful pressure. And beyond that, and I think you're right, Nathan, that we're over we're over exaggerating U.S. power. When the Palestinians wanted to go to the U.N for a general assembly decision on statehood, it was able to do so in defiance of U.S. opposition. I, I agree, but it's also very important to understand, I think especially for people outside the United States, who have a tendency to imagine the pro-Israel lobby in Washington as a kind of conspiracy lurking in the corridors. Not at all. That this is the exp it, this is an expression significantly, especially in the Republican Party, where American Jews don't wield a lot of influence, of a very deep-seated strain in American Christianity that leads to a strong affinity with the idea of Jews being in the land of Israel. Now, I'm not to say the organization of American Jews is also very important. It's especially important because American, Arab Americans and Palestinian Americans and Muslim Americans are not well organized. So they do not represent a significant counterbalance yet. They may well in the future generations. The U.S., if it wanted, can fundamentally change the balance of power on the ground and yet does not wield any of those tools in a constructive fashion. It's blocked Israel from scrutiny 32 times in the UN Security Council using its veto power. It's its primary financier. It provides unfettered military support in contravention of US law. It doesn't even apply the Foreign Assistance Act or the Arms Export Control Act, which is US law vis-a-vis -vis its, oh. its weapons shipments. And so if the US wanted to, it could. And yet it doesn't want to, and it's unable to when it does. Would you say that America has been largely silent about the illegal expansion of settlements? Of course. Uh, I mean, it's U.S. policy to condemn the, the settlements with regularity, but not to do much more than that. And so, uh, it's, it, in terms of literal silence, it hasn't literally been silent. It regularly condem condemns largely them. Largely silent. But when there was an announcement, in terms of actions, the U.S. has been silent in, in its actions uh, for the most part. Yes, Washington turns, although you're, although names right, they, they make rhetorical statements. America does not apply pressure to Israel to stop the subsidizing of settlements, which I think is, is, is bad for America and actually bad for the Palestinians and actually also bad for Israel. Had the U.S. exerted some sort of accountability, it, we would not be in a position today where Israel has the most right-wing government that we've ever seen. And it's precisely because of our failure to exert that accountability that the Israeli leadership has become more emboldened, more brave more racist than it's ever been before. And I, I think it's false hope to continue putting all our eggs in the American basket. We've also had this entire conversation as if it's only Israel that has to move in order to make a solution possible. It's not? 
Uh, no, I don't think that's the case. It depends, of course, what you believe that solution would be. But if you believe, if you take as your parameter that it would look something like the, uh, the, the, the Clinton parameters of December 2000, then, in fact, that requires very significant concessions from the Palestinians as well, probably, on, on, the, on questions like refugees, perhaps on the question about, on questions of international troops in the Jordan Valley and other things that could but be... But let me ask you, Peter, then, you, not, you just so said... It's not only, it's not... So I agree no, but that Peter, Israel has Peter. a long way to go more further than it did and that that will require serious pressure. But that's not the whole story. You just said that America is very close to Israel. There's no denying that. And then we talk about the Clinton parameters as if they are an objective reality. They're not. They're not. No, I didn't say they are objective reality. So, so why would the Palestinians make concessions to a friend of Israel? That, look, the, the, the question in, in politics, the question is not really what the objective reality is. It is what the greatest degree of justice that it is politically possible to have is, right? And I think that is probably somewhere between the Clinton parameters and the Arab Peace Initiative, right? And there, there are important ambiguities between them, but they, base, they have certain common things in common. The idea of the 67 lines, maybe with small swaps, the idea of a divided Jerusalem, I think that is the fundamental basis upon which the, we have the best likelihood of peace. Peter, I'm really, really glad you brought up politics and power because I think what's missing from the discussion of peace talks is, is ironically, they can be very apolitical. We begin to have the, you know, we, we, we draw on liberal ideals of conflict resolution, two so sides, rhetorical. two sides, just negotiate, and we forget that this is, Israel is a nuclear power, the strongest military power in the Middle East with unequivocal U.S. financial military and, and political support against a Palestinian population, which is also under American tutelage. The, the Palestinian nation, so to speak, or Bantu stands, cannot exist without American aid and cannot exist without you American the Palestinian leadership. The Palestinian leadership. Today, Pal the Palestinian economy is a charity economy. And so we have this discussion and a vast of making concessions in negotiations when there is one side that's able to completely alter the reality that exists and change what's politically that possible, does, that, and the other side doesn't have that same well, leverage. That, that, there is a fundamental question that we're not asking here, which is, do the Clinton parameters or the Arab Peace Initiative, do they reflect a realistic resolution to the uh, Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict? And your answer? I'm not sure that they are. Why? Uh, I think that they both tend to focus on issues, on problems derived from Israel's 1967 conquest of the West Bank and Gaza, and treating the conflict between Palestinians and Israelis as though it were created in June 1967, and that's clearly not the case. You mean it's also about dismissing the right of return for Palestinian refugees as anything realistic? That's exactly right. And, and both the Arab Peace Initiative and the Clinton parameters and the entire Oslo framework are premised on this notion almost that no one would acknowledge that this is what it is, but more or less that we're going to trade a solution of 67 in order to close the door on, on 48. It seems to me when you look at the last 20 years at least that America has a veto over whatever Israel must do in the Middle East. But Israel has a veto on whatever America wants in Palestine that no matter what happens, it will be Netanyahu, not Obama. It will be Barack, not Clinton. It will be Sharon, not Bush, that have the last word over what's going to happen in the occupied territories. Hence, American role is really limited. Remember, the Labor Party, even into the late 90s, was not even in favor of a Palestinian state at all. The, the movement that, that happened in Israeli politics between, uh, between in, over the course of the late 90s to 2000 was very substantial. It's what created the basis for Ehud Olmert going even further. And that was significantly part of American pressure, whether you think it's good enough or not. I think that you bringing up the U.S., the U.S.'s inability to do something is, really, is not only reflective of the strength of the Israel lobby, which is not a conspiracy. Like the NRA and other lobbies, it's just talented. It does what it does and knows how to leverage power and benefits from fortune of convergence with some U.S. interests. But is there an American interest in a powerful, expanded, expansive, uh, confident Israel? Absolutely not. The U.S. stands more to gain if it were to actually create a Palestinian state, whether or not that actually serves uh, Palestinian interests and actually meets the, their uh, full spectrum of rights is another question. But the U.S. stands more to gain by creating a Palestinian Why? state because it mitigates, it neutralizes the criticism of the U.S. in the Middle East as a hypocrite and that it d doesn't really believe in human rights anywhere. Peter, help us out here with the question of Kerry. Many people in Israel and Palestine are surprised. They don't understand 
what excites Kerry all of a sudden? Certainly, there's nothing on the Israeli side that you know shows the way forward towards uh, you know peaceful coexistence between two states. What is he? What is motivating him? Does he think he's going to be able to wring Palestinian concessions or concessions out of the Palestinians? Well, I I, I think that for for one thing, um, this has always been an area where you try to prove American leadership, and I think Kerry thinks probably rightly that the era in which America is going to have any chance to exercise leadership towards a two-state solution is coming to an end. Uh, Amer and, and so he may be the last American diplomat who can really make this effort. The effort is very important to America's prestige in the region and around the world, and I think Kerry believes, and I happen to agree with him, that if it fails, the consequences could be much worse. I, I believe that Kerry has received some kind of private assurances that Netanyahu is willing to go further than the Americans had initially expected. And I, and I think that to the degree there is some optimism around uh, Kerry and his staff. Further? Meaning? Meaning that they had assumed that Netanyahu is, is fundamentally opposed to Palestinian statehood and through talking to him they I believe have come to the conclusion that he is genuinely interested in a Palestinian state and is willing to make larger territorial concessions than they had thought he would be willing to do maybe territorial concessions approaching those that Olmert had put forward in 2008 that sounds like deja vu all over again it's a know? bit it's a bit strange and I know you don't believe this but it's a bit ironic to say that they're expecting greater territorial concessions simultaneously as announcing 1200 new settlement units and so I think that so long as as we continue this process based on the terms of Oslo, then it's bound to fail because Oslo, if we remember, um, its record has uh, facilitated the entrenchment of Israeli settlement expansion. It's, uh, pro it's been processed over substance so that we are applauding ourselves over the continuation of, of process absent substance and it has done nothing to alter the balance of power. Let's go back to our focal point. Let's call a spade a spade then. American leverage is not on Israel, it's on the Palestinian and the Arab side. America has exercised more leverage on the Palestinians because the Palestinians are weaker. There's no question about it. And hence, it. that is the engine of the process. Is but that every time you come back and bring exercised. concessions out of the Palestinians and the Arabs. Well, but, it's, but the Palestinians also have leverage of their own. The leverage they have is... Victimhood? No, the leverage they have is to say bye-bye to the United States, internationalize the conflict. If, when Abbas goes, or when the Palestinian Authority goes, I think it's that that creates a new reality. I disagree wholeheartedly. I think that is the precise moment at which Palestinians have a shot and actually exerting some leverage. There is an entity that exists, it's not called the PA, it's called the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And that entity will exist after the PA is gone and after Abbas is gone, inshallah. And, and, uh, and, and that entity is capable of negotiating in a much more powerful way if the PA did not exist. The leverage is over the PA, not over the PLO. Why does America insist on the peace process? It's 20 years now. It's become a kind of touchstone for American leadership. I also th I think that there are uh, many Americans who genuinely care a lot about what happens in that part of the world because uh, of religious reasons, but I also think one shouldn't exaggerate it. I mean, I think if you ask most Americans what things that they're really, they want their government to do, you could reach a hundred things before they would get to this. So in many ways, it's an elite-driven thing. And you saw that the George W. Bush administration, for most of its presidency, wasn't really interested. So I don't think that it is inevitable that an American administration will decide this is a priority. I think, I think that there's another element here, which is that there are many in the American officials who believe that the conflict is, is intractable. And uh, they look at the situation on the ground. They see a situation that's deteriorating. They see more protests. They see that Abbas may take actions that will result in Israeli counteractions. And for them, it's very simple. They enter this process, and it puts those things on ice for a little bit. And, and so the process is better than no process. It's as simple as that. And the purpose of the process, I mean, let's not uh, delude ourselves. The purpose of the process is not to resolve the conflict, it's to contain it. And you're absolutely right. If we could put ice um, on this process and just keep everything under control so that there is no eruption of actually military violence, then it's fine because it gives the allure that nothing's happening. And yet we can't forget that the structural violence of occupation and apartheid continues against the Palestinians, even in the absence of that military confrontation. I disagree. I think American, American leaders would like to solve the, the, the conflict. They may and not want to solve it the way 
contain it. And that's why they contain it. No, they haven't done anything to solve it. Well, they want to solve it according to the kind of parameters that Bill Clinton laid out. There may be people who disagree with that, but I also agree that their second best alternative is to contain it because they're afraid of what happens if there's no process at all. Has it become a de facto regional forum led by America, an American-led regional order where everyone in the Middle East is judged according to the process. You're a good guy, you're for the process. If you're not for the process, you're the bad guy. Are you an ally of America? You're probably with the process. If you're not, you're not with the process. The process has become the regional order, the compass. It's that foothold for America and the region. I think that the U.S. has a lot of uh, a lot of footholds, and this is not the sole compass. It's one of many, and it, yes, you're right that it's become a litmus, litmus and it defines the, the U.S.'s relationship vis-a-vis most of uh, of of. The Middle Eastern countries, but the U.S. can absolutely change this ba uh, balance of power. But look at it. I mean, they're, they're now they're basically absent from Iraq, although there has been meetings. Uh, absent from Iran and its nuclear project. Absent from Syria. Absent from Egypt. Absent from Libya. The only place that remains is the Middle East peace process. The U.S. looks at a region in which they are losing influence, and they see that this is one place where they can actually uh, exercise some influence, and, and perhaps they're not going to resolve uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but they're at least, as, as I mentioned a second ago, they're at least going to prevent it from uh, going into a downward peace spiral. Peace process as a strategic American national interest. The peace process, not, not necessarily peace. the investment in peace, but the U.S. Just because it does, it, I think the U.S. is exerting influence on a daily basis. Just the who it decides to support, which countries it decides to fund, the military funding to to Egypt, to Saudi Arabia, to Jordan. I think that the U.S. is quite influential in the Middle East and continues to be so. And there is no resistance uh, against that. So yes, the peace process might be a fixture within that, but all it is is a balance of power and maintaining the status quo or that is, or the imbalance of power, that is very short-sighted in, in its prospects. Well, short-sighted, maybe, maybe not. Gentlemen, Nora, thank you. Thank you. And I'll be back with a final note. When it comes to the peace process, history repeats itself first as a tragedy, then a farce, and back again. So if the appointment of Israel's darling, Dennis Ross, as peace envoy was tragic, the appointment of Martin Indyk 20 years later is certainly a farce. It's comical that President Obama asked Israelis and Palestinians to show courage, leadership, and originality, then appoints another Israel darling to head his peace efforts. Indyk heads the Saban Center, the Middle East wing of the Brookings Institution. The same Hayim Saban who told the Israeli paper Haaretz that he's an admirer of Ariel Sharon and dreams of being Israel's information minister. Alas, Indink has already gotten his dream job after serving at APAC, the Israel lobby, and heading its think tank, the Washington Institute. And once again, hypocrisy has a face to go along. And that's the way it goes. Write to me with your ideas and suggestions. Until next time.